So Lord, we pray that you'll be with us now as we look into your word, as we, we celebrate, in a sense, Memorial Day, the time we recognize those that have given their lives for our freedom. Almighty God, help us to not take it glibly. Help us to remember such great sacrifice. So Lord, hide me behind the cross that we might hear from you today. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is going to be, from a reading standpoint, a very simple reading. It's going to be just one verse. Our scripture reading is going to be from John chapter 15, verses, verse 13. And it's, it's a, I think it's a perfect verse for this weekend, this Memorial Day weekend. It, it, it reads, if you'll follow along, it's going to be on the screen. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Uh, that verse was part of a conversation that, that Jesus was having with his disciples not long before he would die on the cross. It was during, and, during the process of that last supper that he would have, and that's one of the reasons we're going to be doing communion today. Perhaps you recall a portion of the verse that I read last week from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It, it read, For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So in Christ we have ultimately, or really the ultimate of sacrifices. John 3.16, which many of you know, For God so loved the world, his creation, all that he created, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So it seemed appropriate to me for us to take that break from 2 Corinthians to, as we approach this Memorial Day celebrated tomorrow, that we should consider the words of Jesus in both the biblical and, if you will, the American context. This idea to give one's life for others is the greatest sacrifice anyone could make. Think, think about these. September 11th, 2001, the chef and a former Marine named Brian, excuse me, Benjamin Keith Clark was preparing meals for the, the people at the Fiduciary Trust Company on the 96th floor of the World Trade Center as the first plane hit. And Clark, the chef, did not decide to try to escape. Instead, he took the steps to guide others to safety. It was reported that he ensured that everyone in his department, as well as all the 96th floor offices, were evacuated. Benjamin did not survive as he put others first. 2002 NFL player Patrick Daniel Tillman Jr. put a lucrative football career on hold along with his brother. They joined the Army and they went to serve their country after the attack on 9-11. Tillman served a number of combat missions in both Iraq and Afghanistan and ultimately was killed in the mountains of Afghanistan in 2004 as a result of friendly fire, confusion on the battlefield, if you will. Although Patrick didn't die in the midst of a, of a fight with the enemy, he gave up this well-paying NFL career for the country he loved. And he acted on that knowing that he might not survive it. Wars are brutal. June 1st, 2007, Staff Sergeant Travis Atkins and his Army unit were doing routine clearance in the town of Abu Samak in southwest Baghdad, and they noticed two suspicious, suspicious, yeah, suspicious men trying to cross the road that they were securing. Having heard reports that there was insurgents nearby, Atkins and the soldiers in his Humvee yelled at the pair, who started to act erratically. Atkins had his MV pull over. Atkins tried to search one of the men, but he resisted, so the two started fighting. That's when Atkins realized that the man had a suicide vest under his clothes. A short while later, the insurgent grabbed the trigger, and without pausing, Atkins bear-hugged the man from behind, threw him to the ground, and pinned him there. With Staff Sergeant Atkins on top of him, the insurgent detonated the bomb, killing Atkins as he shielded his fellow soldiers that were just a few feet away. Outside of the battlefield, Gina Phillips and Elizabeth Joyce, just two of many known mothers who have made 
the difficult decision to forego medical treatment in exchange for the life of their unborn babies. In 2010, Joyce turned down lung cancer treatment to save her baby's life. In 2011, Phillips, age 17, likewise skipped her cancer treatment, knowing that it would terminate her unborn child. And both women died just weeks after giving birth. 2016, 10-year-old Kirsa Larson saw a Mercedes SUV rolling down their sloped driveway with two-year-old Emma Gusich playing in the driveway below. And 10-year-old Kiera sprinted after the vehicle, pushed Emma out of the way, but lost her life in the process. More recently, 2022, Irma Garcia, Eva Morales, both fourth-grade teachers at the Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, died trying to protect their fourth graders from an 18-year-old gunman. And, and this is where my planned digression came in. The, the last example gives us a painful question when we see, think about the 19 children and two adults that were killed. 19 children killed for, for no reason. And we hear about that, we see the news and the stories, and we, we wonder, where is God? And the problem is not the absence of God, but it is the presence of sin. <laughs> we live in a fallen world. Life is demeaned. Justice is often perverted. So why such young and innocent children? The disciples often saw things in black and white when they were with Jesus, and, and they thought that problems must result because of sin in someone's life. Someone must have sinned. John 9 tells of a time that they were, they were traveling together and they saw a, a blind man who had been blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus replied, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. In the case that we just, that verse talks about, Jesus miraculously gave sight to this man in an odd way by spitting on the ground and making some mud and, and putting it on his eyes, and that caused a lot of people to be wondering what was going on. And quite frankly, it caused a lot of trouble for the blind man because the religious leaders over there said, no, this is the Sabbath, and making mud is, is work, and so this is wrong, and so this guy must be not God. This guy must not be the Messiah. He must be a, 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 a preposter. And yet, that man came to know Jesus for his salvation. God was glorified in the process of that. At least one person found salvation. When he saw Jesus and said, tell me who the Messiah is, and Jesus said, I am he. And we are told that man that was blind from birth, that was miraculously healed by Jesus, believed. There's no doubt that the choices that we make and the the sinful behavior that we might in, get involved in can have dire consequences. For instance, the, the man who walks away from his family can cause lasting damage on his children. I saw a documentary recently, here's one of those unplanned digressions, of a guy, famous music arranger, everybody that sings really wants to have you know, him involved because everything he does is hits and stuff like that. And, and you go through, he's talking in this documentary about his life, and this is a guy that's been married like four or five times because anytime he feels uncomfortable, he says he runs. And he had kids from all these different things. And the kids seem to be doing well now, but the whole idea is it has lasting consequences on those kids. There's consequences for sin. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services states that fatherless children are dramatically greater risk of drug and alcohol abuse. If the father leaves and there's no father figure, look what happens. There is no real victimless crimes. I, I think that's a myth when we talk about things that are victimless crimes. Prostitution, victimless crime. No, it hurts both the woman, the man, and in likely cases, the man's family. God did not cause the rampage that killed 19 children and two adults in Uvalde. Sin did. 
not, not just the sin of the shooter, but the sin and the failures of others as well along the way. Sins of commission, sins of omission. People that knew what was right or knew what was wrong and they, they didn't do anything about it, they did it anyways. And, and people that failed to do what they knew was right. This idea of commission, a sin that I, I, I faithfully do, I do because I'm going to do it. Omission, those things, because there's things that I know I should do, but I said, no, nah, it, it's too much trouble. So where is God? Where was God? I, I think a song by John Michael Montgomery, although it's not a biblical per se, captures something big. It's a song that every time I hear it, it affects me emotionally. I find that when I read it, often I am effectively emotionally. You'd think, you know, over time I, I would become sensitive to it, but maybe I hope I never become sensitive to it. It's a country western song, but I love the words and I love the thought that it brings out. It, it says, her parents never took the young girl to church, never spoke of his name, never read her his word. Two non-believers walking lost in this world took their baby with them. What a sad little girl. Her daddy drank all day and mommy did drugs, never wanted to play or give kisses and hugs. She'd watch the TV and sit there on the couch while her mom fell asleep and her daddy went out. And the drinking and the fighting just got worse every night. Behind their couch, she'd be hiding. Oh, what a sad little life. Like it always does, the bad just got worse with every slap and every curse until her daddy, in a drunk rage one night, used a gun on her mom and then took his life. Some people from the city took the girl far away to a new mom and dad, kisses and hugs every day. Her first day in Sunday school, the teacher walked in, and the small little girl stared at a picture of him. She said, I know that man up there on the cross. <clears throat> I don't know his name, but I know he got off because he was there in my old house he held me close to his side as I hid there behind my couch the night my parents died. It's a powerful song. And it helps us to remember that even in the midst of difficult and deep times that God is there, still there with us. And in the illustration that's provided here, that little girl felt the presence of someone she didn't know until someone could say, this is Jesus. I suggest to you that that God was there with those children and he was there with those teachers, Irma and Eva. He was there with the first responders even if they made mistakes and he will continue to be there for those grieving families. And, and if you believe in this idea that is, is, it is, emanates from the, from the Bible but it's not specifically stated in the Bible this idea of an age of accountability or of an age of innocence those 19 children are with the Lord now Matthew chapter 18 verses 1 through 5 says the disciples came to Jesus and asked who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and Jesus called a little child and had him stand among them and he said I tell you the truth unless you change and become like little children you will never enter the kingdom of heaven Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. The, the idea of the age account of accountability suggests that there is a certain age where children become accountable to how they respond to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Some in the past have suggested that the age was 13. That was in accordance with the Jewish practice of Bat or bar minstra, boy or female. It's when the boy and the girl now becomes a man or a woman. I, I would suggest that the age of accountability is likely fluid as children today are inundated, inundated with ideas and actions that quite frankly rob their innocence and, and their ability to understand things seems to be more and more earlier in age. And quite frankly, we often find very young children putting their faith in Christ and being baptized. In the bigger picture, history is filled with the memories of men and women that gave their lives for the ultimate sacrifice. Those children sacrificed. 
not for someone's freedom, but because there are little children in the wrong place at the wrong time. Since World War I, 645,000 men and women have died fighting for freedom. It doesn't count the Revolutionary War when there was a fight for independence and, and, and freedom to, to govern themselves. The Civil War, a time where they say brother against brother, where there was people fighting to make it so those people, that the, the slavery issue was taken care of as, as largely Christians were against and trying to abolish slavery. And that Civil War that sought after the freedom of those who were robbed of their freedom. As tragic as as senseless as death can be, death with purpose can change the world. In all the examples I gave ahead of those that, from 9-11 to those the little girl that saved a, a, a child, to the, the teachers that worked to save children in their fourth grade class, the loss of life meant something to others. And quite frankly, the impact of what happened in Uvalde is going to resonate in many ways for those families that, that have to endure it and that have people coming to, to help them. And quite frankly, some that might find God in their lives as a result. As the saying goes, all gave some, but some gave all. And Jesus tells his disciples that greater love has no one than this than they lay down their life for another. I hope, I, I pray, that in the midst of all the gatherings of family and friends, the, the barbecues and the picnics and all those things that we try to do on this kind of the first real summery type weekend, that we remember on Memorial Day that we are called to remember. Remember those who gave their life. It's not, not so much a time to celebrate and recognize our current veterans. We'll, we'll do that on November 11th, I believe, this year is Veterans Day. It is a time to remember those that gave it all and to ponder the price that they paid for our freedom and for the freedom of others. To perhaps think about the graves maintained in 26 countries around the world that signify the life of an American soldier lost in battle so someone else could have freedom. Memories are important. In fact, memories are critical. God called us and calls us to remember him. Genesis chapter 9, the, the flood has taken place. God is starting over, and what did God do? He, he created a rainbow, something that we can scientifically explain, but God put that in there as a reminder that they might remember God's promise that never again will I destroy the entire world with a flood. Exodus chapter 12 talks about the Passover meal that is used. To, this is what's going to happen before you get out. I'm going to kill all the firstborn, and this is how you're going to protect. You're going to sacrifice a lamb. You're going to put the, the blood on the doorpost and the lentil of the door, and when I see the blood, I will pass over. And when you do this, I want you to do this annually. And when an alien or a foreigner or one of your children says, why is this day different? You tell them. This is what God does. It is a call to remember. As, as Moses is getting ready to be taken by the Lord, Deuteronomy chapter 5, he reminds the people of Israel, remember that you were slaves. You were in bondage until God delivered you. Deuteronomy chapter 7, remember God's power, Moses says, when you were confronted by your enemies and what God did to protect you. Deuteronomy chapter 8, remember how God, Moses said, led you in the 40 years in the wilderness, but he was there with you the whole time. Your sandals did not wear out. Your clothes did not wear out. Even though you were being punished for your disobedience and your failure to honor God, God was still there with you in that 40 years. When they finally 
cross over into the promised land with Joshua chapter 4, and Joshua was told by God, tell them to pick up 12 stones from the center of the river and bring them up on the ground, rocks that would have been smooth and polished and look different than the, the, the rocks in that area outside that are weather-worn and stuff, but these ones are smooth and rolled. Put them out there, create these standing stones, and when people come here and say, what's this all about? You tell them what God did. How God parted this, not parted, how he heaped up the waters of the Jordan so you could cross over on dry ground. You tell people what this means. You remember First Chronicles chapter 16, we are told, tell of his wonders. Remember the wonders the Lord has done, the, his miracles and his judgments, and seek his face. What do you remember? What are your standing stones? If you were to go to Israel today and go to a place called Gezer, you would see a series of stones stacked up covered so it's just like pillars now and they believe that these were set up, set up there by Canaanite tribes that had a treaty and the idea is that when they saw those stones they would remember the treaty they had and wouldn't fight something to remind them what do you have to remind you Jesus reminded the people of his day to listen and to remember what the prophets had said because the prophets tell about me but he also provided some standing stones and memories that would not fade. Paul tells us about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, For what I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, communion Sundays, and normally we would do it on the first Sunday, it just seems so appropriate that we do it today should stand out as something different. Some faith traditions choose to do it every day, every Sunday, and that's wonderful. But at the same time, we try not to make it a road expression that we just go through the motions, but it's something different. Something stands out today. Why is this day every, any different as the Passover meal? Because let me tell you what God has done. Let me tell you what Jesus did in my life. As we reflect and respect the sacrifices that many made for us, let us remember the greatest sacrifice, the greatest push for our freedom by Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, God with us. Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26 says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his sacrifice he did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished he did it so as to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus that's a really important verse for us to get a hold of because it says that God still requires justice Sin has to be paid for, but God chose to pay for it by the cross, the death on the cross of the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, so that we can come before him righteous, not because of what we have done, but because what he has done for us. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. I ask this question many times, many Sundays, and for some, you might say, well, you, 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 are, you know me. <laughs> Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior? I've told you many times about the pastor in Dallas, Texas, when you know, I had been a Christian for a while now, and 
wanted to join the church. When I went up to shake hands with him, we did it publicly. I went up to shake hands with him and said, I want, we want to join this church. He looked me straight in the eyes and said, Chris, do you love Jesus? Do you really love Jesus? If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, even if it is right now, recognizing you fall short because you, you have sin in your life, you have sinned that you, you've not confessed, you can do it right now in the quietness of your own heart and your own place. And if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the, the table is open to you. This time that we remember what Jesus did for us, that each time we do it, we celebrate his death on our behalf. So I'm going to ask Cincy to come up and give us some background. And, and as you are ready, you come forward, take of both the bread and the cup. There is some gluten-free here as well. Take of both the bread and cup, bring it back to your, your place, and we'll partake together. You come when you're ready.